welcome to Garden Ways Adventures. My name is Malie, and today I am so excited to have Savannah here in my yard. Yeah, now Savannah, can you tell me a little bit about who you are and why you're actually here? Yeah, so I'm Savannah Peterson. I work with the Central Utah Water Conservancy District as the Water Conservation Programs Manager. So I help run a lot of our residential rebate programs that we offer. So I inv invited Savannah over here because there is a turf rebate program that Utah is offering. And there's a lot of other things that are happening in Utah do to do with the drought and water. I think, you know, if you've been on my channel at all, you've seen my, you know, what do Utah water efficient landscapes look like? You've seen that series. But there is a definite drought going on, maybe not this year, but what do you think about that? Is there Well, just to pitch in, um, we measure drought in a lot of different ways. There's like the immediate drought that's, you know, maybe affecting our lawns and our crops and that kind of thing. But then there's longer lasting droughts. So this year we might be out of the immediate drought that's affecting us individually, but things like uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell are still very much at risk. Uh, Great Salt Lake still needs a lot of water and a lot of statistics have shown that we need another often six years is the estimate that I've heard the most often oh, wow. of winters exactly like this last one to get out of the drought. So. Okay, so this is making it for lost time. Yes. Not the immediate, I don't need to water today because it rained a half an inch mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah, we're thinking long term here, we are not out of the drought, but this winter helped. Yeah, and, and we can't hedge our bets and say, okay, phew, it's over with, all the winters from now on are gonna be great because that's the way it's been in the past. In fact, a lot of climatologists this last year have said that it's practically a statistical impossibility that we'll get the six or seven years that we need in the, a row to get out of the drought. So. Which is really sad to hear because I love all the rain and I love all the yeah. snow. But that leads us to issues that we're having in Utah. And you know, the state is coming up with several different things to, to kind of help mitigate the problems. But this is kind of what I wanted to bring up a little bit. A lot of people feel like Utah and the Water Conservancy districts are meddling on their properties. Have you heard that at all? We have heard that a lot. Um, but why would they say that? What's, what's the state doing and what's going on to make people say that? Yeah, so the state and districts have implemented some water efficiency standards that are required if cities would like their residents to be eligible to participate in our water conservation programs. So um, cities do not have to do it, but to have this funding available to them, it is required. And it's just some um, efficiency standards that would be implemented into municipal codes regarding new construction only. This doesn't affect existing landscapes at all. That's what our rebate programs are for. But these standards are talking about uh, how much lawn and where lawn is used on new construction, um, both residential and commercial industrial municipal. Um, so it's essentially saying we want you to not ban lawn, but just put it in places that are reasonable and sustainable so that we can keep growth moving forward and get rid of lawn in areas where it doesn't need to be. So it's preventing waste. So how much lawn are they saying is appropriate? So for front and side yards of new construction, residential new construction, the maximum is 35%. But if you think about, if you take all of your lawn out of park strips and have, and you know, have paths in your side yard instead of just strips of lawn, that's still a pretty usable, playable space in your front yard. And then in the backyard, homeowners are free to do whatever they want. Um, Say that again. Homeowners are free to do whatever they want in their backyard, which is the place you play the most yeah. often anyways. So this doesn't sound very onerous. I, I'm biased. I don't think it is. Um, and then in, I will mention in commercial, institutional, municipal, new constructions, the limit is 20% maximum lawn in the landscaped area outside of active recreation zones. So parks, playing fields, community spaces and multifamily developments, those are all exempt from that because those are usable spaces where we want people to be using their grass, but it's getting rid of like lawn and parking lot islands. That's just a waste. Okay, I love that. So to recap, new construction only, mm -hmm. the maximum amount of lawn is 35%, which I will link a video up at the top that talks about local scapes that I've done in the past and show you several different local scapes where you look at that and it's like, oh, that's actually quite a bit of lawn. Mm -hmm and they don't mess with your backyard. Yep. yep, and the reason it's front and side yard is because that's where we see the most wasted water on land. That's where we have strips of grass that are less than eight feet wide, which are really hard to irrigate. And is so that part of the code? Part of, yes, part of the code is removing 
or preventing grass in areas less than eight feet wide and on slopes greater than 25%. That makes a lot of sense. Both, both for irrigation efficiency reasons. That makes a ton of sense, yeah. So is there anything else in that, like the standard, so 35% uh, for residential, 20% for uh, commercial, no strips of grass, less than eight feet wide. Anything else in there? And then the slope. And then the slope. 25%. Which, if you can't sit on a lawn chair on your lawn comfortably because it's too steep of a slope, you're not using it anyways, and it's too hard to irrigate. So that's another pretty reasonable use. But those are, those are the three things that are required out of these efficiency standards. And again, only in front and side yards of new construction. That is wonderful. And okay, so if the cities adopt these standards, what do the residents get out of it? The residents, the existing residents, get access to these great programs for if they want to convert existing landscapes. Um, right now we're offering two to three dollars per square foot of lawn removed in existing landscapes, depending on the kind of project you do, um, which I think we might talk about yeah. a little bit later. But um, you get access to these programs. Your city gets access to more funding for, you know, um, any water efficiency projects that they want to do. So no more having to complain about the city park watering when it's raining outside because now they'll have access to smart controller funding so that they can <laughs> more easily control that. So it helps the whole community. And then new homeowners get the benefit of already having a water efficient landscape installed. It's usually two to five years after a homeowner moves in that they start landscaping projects. And a lot of times it's to remove lawn. So they have the benefit of just having a water efficient landscape already installed when they move in. So let's talk a little bit more about the cities because a lot of people complain about the cities and what the cities do and don't do and municipal, you know, well, the cities are the municipalities, but like, uh, large companies and they're like, we're not doing any, we're not saving any water until they save water. What are some of the problems you've seen with cities and like their water conservation efforts? Yeah, so a lot of issues are um, funding issues in cities where it's just not in the budget to do some extra landscaping here or there. Um, a lot of times cities are more focused on maintenance because that's what they have the staff for and the budget for. But uh, having access to these programs, if they adopted the water efficiency standards, could essentially give them free money. <laughs> it's, it's money that is available for these exact projects that cities are looking to do. So water efficient landscaping can be expensive. Grass is cheap, which is why it's used so often. Because the parks are huge. Yeah. And, and so the larger the scale, the more expensive it is. And cities, by and large, are really conscious about the taxpayer money that they're using and they want to be responsible about it. And so it's their often hesitant to move forward with these larger landscaping projects because they're so expensive and they're trying to be responsible. So having access to this funding is a, is a great way to get something done that they want to get done that's the right thing to do without putting extra burden on the taxpayer. The reason I asked about cities is I've been talking to my city, the city of Pleasant Grove, about the water efficiency standards because I was a little worried because it looked like they hadn't adopted them, but they are going to be adopting them. And they're adopting them because they actually applied for the grant to put in secondary water metering, mm -hmm. which to some people is a huge like red flag. They're going to come onto my property. They're going to put water meters. They're going to mess in my, I mean, Pleasant Grove, when they put their secondary water in, the promise seemed to have been that people could use as much water as they wanted for a set price. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, the point of water meters is to know how much of our limited resource we're using. So uh, right now it's kind of a mystery sometimes about how much water is being used in our secondary systems because it's not metered. So uh, water in Utah, especially secondary water, is sometimes seen as just an unlimited resource that has no strings attached. But Really quick, can yeah. you, because there might be some people who are not here you know, from Utah. Oh, yeah. What is secondary water? Secondary water is... Uh, it's water that's just a little less processed than the potable water that we use or the drinking water that we use. So drinking water goes through many more filtration steps before it gets to the um, end user. Secondary water is filtered a little bit, but it is not treated the same as drinking water. So it's a little less expensive to process um, and it's used more in outdoor irrigation. Okay, yeah, so really quickly, I traced Pleasant Grove secondary water you know, we went up and looked at, I think it was Deer Creek. They get some of their water from Deer Creek, but most of their secondary water comes from the canyons here. So they, there's a spring that, or a little creek that comes out of the canyon. They fill, I think we have 
maybe it's three tanks, two or three tanks. They fill those tanks with the spring water. They filter it a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Get all the sticks out. <laughs> Get all the sticks out and the rocks. And then they, uh, and that's what we use for irrigation water. So mm -hmm. that's basically the secondary water, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep. And it's, it's been hard to track in the past because we it's don't know needed. how much is going through the system. So these meters are a great way to know how much is being used, how much is being lost in a system. That's important is we can track now if there's any major leaks anywhere because we know how much water was put into the system and how much was taken out. That's a, yeah, so, that's highly important. I think. Yeah, which is a great way to catch leaks quickly. Another benefit of this secondary water metering is it'll be easier to track your water usage and again, be able to catch leaks, but at your home as well. So there are apps along with a lot of these secondary water meters that you can track down to the minute yeah. and open your app, see how much water is flowing. If you know your sprinklers aren't on, but there's water moving, you know you have a problem somewhere in your landscape. A lot of beneficial uses for it. And what I really love is I know Davis County has had this implemented for a year or two, right? Yep. Maybe even more, I don't know how long they've had it, but they said that they, al they saw almost an immediate 30% reduction in water use. Yep. They didn't have to find their customers. They didn't have to charge more. It was the customers seeing how much water they were using yep. and voluntarily reducing. Yep. You want to be responsible. Everybody in Utah knows that water is important and we all want to take care of it. Everybody wants to be responsible about the resources that we have here. And this is a good way to make sure that you are making wise choices. We have to take some measures mm -hmm. yes. because you know it's, we're getting to the point where it's getting dangerous. Yep. If the Salt Lake dries out, that's, we all have heard about the toxic cloud that can happen. Yep. If we don't have water for landscapes at all, that's yeah. going to be horrible. Yep. Um, water is a huge limiting factor for growth, which is one of the biggest economic drivers in our state. So without growth, our economy takes a big downturn. And, we and wanna, our kids won't be able to live here. And our kids won't be able to live here. Yeah, uh, you're going to have to be exporting your kids to California. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Switch the, the roles there. Um, but yeah, it's... It's important in so many ways to the health and economy of our state. Cities get the help, we get the help, and then we can all end up being better stewards of our own properties. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. I know a lot of people will disagree with me, but this is, this is how I look at it. So let's get into, you know, besides these, you know, standards that they want the cities to implement, and they're, you know, giving like little teasers here, you can have this if you implement these standards. We talked a little bit in the beginning about the turf rebate programs that the homeowners get. Let's get into a little more of that because I think that's important for everybody. Mm -hmm. How do you, so the first you qualify by your city being qualified. Yep. By living in a city that has adopted these water efficiency standards. Um, what can you do if your city's, how do you know if your city is qualified and if it's not, what can you do? Yeah, so there's a great website called conservewater.utah.gov, I believe. Um, and on that website, there's a tab that says either landscape incentives or rebates. If you click on that, it'll have a list of cities that have adopted these water efficiency standards. There are some cities that are on there that are working on the standards. Um, so if your city isn't there, don't panic and think that they've rejected it wholeheartedly. They might just still be in the process of adopting these standards. Um, but that's a good place to go and check to see if you can qualify. Um, and then all of our programs are housed on utahwatersavers.com. So you can go in there and you can actually go into the Utah Water Savers, set up your account and then look and see what's available. And if the landscape re rebates are not available, what can you do? First, we've seen so much good success with residents calling their representatives in their city just to say, hey, I am a representative of this, of this city. This is something I care about. Have you adopted these? Are you working on it? Can I just put in my two cents saying that I care about this issue? And that's a lot more effective than us at the water district or at the state saying, your residents care about this. If they're hearing it from the residents themselves, that holds a lot more weight. And truly, we, I've gotten a lot more faith in the, in the democratic system <laughs> with, the with, by, by people saying, like I've seen so much change in these cities when their residents reach out. It's given me a lot of faith that people do have a voice and can make a difference. Yeah. And and don't, you know, like she was saying, some of the cities are working on them. I mean, Pleasant Grove's not on the list, but they're, they're gonna be adopting the standards. Mm -hmm. So just call and politely ask and say what, you know, and if they say we're not going to do the standards, then maybe you can ask why, you know, yeah. there's city meetings you could go to and ha have your voice heard. Yeah. Yep. You know, talk to your neighbors. Yep, and we at the Water District are always happy to 
go and talk to these cities in person and uh, straighten out any confusion. So if a city seems like they, there might've been some misunderstandings about what was required, call us, we'll come talk yes. to them. <laughs> we love to go to city council meetings and, <laughs> and uh, make sure that everybody understands what's going on. If I wanted to remove that grass and get paid for it, what do I need to do if my city has already adopted the standards? So first I will say, if you are interested in these programs, do not remove your grass before you have applied for the program and had a site visit. That is the kicker. If we are not able to come out and measure it in person before it's removed, you don't qualify for a rebate. Essentially, we need to know how much grass was there before you started so that we know how much grass you removed and can pay you accordingly. The website will ask you to submit a photo of your water bill, just a copy of your water bill, um, and answer some questions about your property so that we can make sure you are in a qualifying area. Really quick, I want to put in a plug and say, if your city doesn't qualify for the landscaping incentive program, all cities across Utah, everybody qualifies for a toilet rebate and smart controller rebate programs, That's which are for irrigation efficiency. And then if you have a home that was built before 1994, you can get money for replacing those old inefficient toilets. Just wanted to put in a plug. If you can't do your landscaping project, there's still you things something. you can do. <laughs> no, there's still hope to be water wise. But yeah, when you're applying for your landscape incentive program, that's our turf buyback program. You submit photos of what your landscape looks like right now. That helps our technicians catch any big red flags before we start. Also, it's fun to have as a comparison <laughs> for when you've started. Before and and, yeah, before and after, it's really great. Uh, and then you submit a plan of what you want to do. It doesn't have to be very detailed. The more detailed, the better, because that helps our technicians you know, give you some pointers if you give them more information. Yeah, really quick on that. I'm a landscape designer and I have been doing a lot of clients that want these turf rebate programs. Mm -hmm. um, I work with a contractor and my design, I mean, it takes me at least a month to do it, but there's, you know, clients that are ready to move forward really quickly. So what the contractor does is he draws out a really quick rendition of what the plan is going to kind of look like mm -hmm. so that we know, so you guys know you know, that the homeowner has a plan in mind and then they can move forward while I'm finishing the actual design. Yeah, sometimes the, the things like it laying out exactly where the irrigation is going to go or what plants go in what area of the landscape, that, that takes a little more time and thought and right. you and don't need to necessary. know it right now, you yeah. know. So that's good. So you don't need the detailed plan. Yep. I literally got a plan submitted that was crayon on napkin about a month ago, and it was great. So you don't need to be a professional designer. I love it. Thank you but, for saying that but, because people get intimidated. Yeah, it's, it's a scary process. And last year, I will say that the, the rules for submitting plans was a lot more intense and was asking a lot more of homeowners. So we tried to make it easier this year. If you don't want to pay a professional designer like me, they can go onto the Localscapes website. Yes. And they walk you step by step with several different free classes mm -hmm. on how to do the design yourself. And I've seen some of those properties and I'm gonna be featuring some of those properties that homeowners design themselves. Yep. And that actually is a great segue. One of the requirements to apply for this program is to have taken one of these landscaping classes. Oh, so you if, have to do it anyway. Yep, because we wanna make sure that our homeowners know what they're getting into before they start their project. Because sometimes you get started and realize it's a lot more than you were bargaining for. So we wanna make sure that you're educated about the requirements beforehand. Um, and uh, it's also a great way to get to know your new landscape because taking care of grass is much different than yes. taking care of water efficient landscapes. It's not necessarily more work, but it's different and it's important to know what you're getting into. So for smaller projects like park strips or side yards, or you know, you're just taking out a bit of grass so you can expand your patio or planting bed, we have a class called Flip Your Stripper Side Yard. Again, free on the Localscapes website. Um, it's about an hour long. It's really great. Uh, they, Very helpful. Those are taught in person or online, so you can watch a pre-recorded version if you want to watch it in your pajamas, or you can come and hang out with us and we'll teach you. Um, and then for larger landscaping projects, like your full front yard or full backyard or both, there's a class called Localscapes University that goes through all of the requirements, but it also teaches you step-by-step -step instructions for designing a landscape. You guys can all be designers. Yes. It's very fun. Or you could just hire somebody named Malie and she'll do it for you. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's a, it's a great resource um, and it's required whether you hire a designer or not actually. So yeah. we want to make sure you're educated beforehand. Okay, so now they've completed the application process. Mm -hmm. They've had the site visit. Yes. Um, I guess burning question, you said, how much money and how do you know how much money you're going to get? Yeah. So 
I, I mentioned earlier that there's different uh, price ranges for different kinds of projects. So those smaller projects I mentioned, park strip, side yard, partial front or backyard conversions, those are eligible for $2 per square foot of grass removed in favor of water efficient landscaping. Um, and then full front or backyard conversions or both. Front or back or front and back? Front and back, but you can do them one at a time too. Okay. So we can split it by just your backyard, just your front yard, or if you're doing the whole thing. Those projects, if they follow all of the local scapes requirements mentioned in that class and on the local scapes website, those can qualify for up to $3 per square foot. Now, I thought I heard somewhere that if you switch out, like if you have a landscape that has flower beds already that have spray heads, if you switch out the spray heads for drip, did I hear there was money for that too? Yes, Central Utah Water, I'm not sure if any other water districts are doing this, but Central Utah Water, we offer a rebate for converting overhead irrigation in planting beds to drip irrigation. It's just 50 cents, but it takes takes the edge off for sure. It's free See, money. It's <laughs> worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I love this. I think we've covered just about, is there anything that you would like to add that we may not have covered? Oh, I would like to clarify and add one more thing. Um, we also are offering a rebate for homes without existing landscaping. If your home oh. is new within, I think it's uh, if it's a home that was built within five years and it has never had landscaping, you can qualify for 50 cents per square foot of project area to install water efficient landscaping. So this is not, you took out your grass before we got there. It's not, your landscape is just full of weeds. It's if it's a new construction, we wanna help you install it correctly the first time. Well, thank you so much. I'm hoping this clarifies things for people, makes it a little less scary, and then opens up opportunities. Mm -hmm opportunities to be better stewards of your property, opportunities to have fun landscapes. Like I said, I'm doing a, I'll link a playlist of my water efficient landscape series. And th some of these properties are just, well, all of them that I've, that, that I've looked at are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So oh it's a fun, it's a fun way to do it. And yeah. Yeah. And if anybody, if I can put in a plug, if anybody has questions, feel free to reach out to us. I'll give, I'll give you our information. Yeah, I'll so, put that, I'll link that in the description below. Um, but we'd, we'd love to help. If your city has questions, um, send them our way. If you have an opportunity where you'd like somebody to come teach a class for a community event, we would oh, love, love to that. do that. So, or, you know, there's like a booth at your county fair or something. Let us know. We'd love to be there to help answer questions. Yeah, and I have to, you know, personal testimony, Savannah and I've talked to Casey over there, the Water Conservation District. They are so helpful. They are so helpful, knowledgeable, and very, very open. So it's just, yeah, it's great to work with you guys. I'm glad. Yeah, not scary at all. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> not to be a big, scary water district. We want yes, to you. love it. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and it's been helpful. If it has, I hope you like, subscribe, change out your landscape to a more water-efficient landscape, and go have a wonderful garden adventure.